Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Hani Rambod, and I have a very special guest with me today. He's coming all the way from Pittsburgh. I have, he's an IFBB competitor, or I should say ex-competitor because he hasn't competed in a while, but IFBB, <laughs> that's right, IFBB pro judge. And uh, most of all, he's also a medical medical doctor, orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Victor Prisk. How are you, doc? I'm doing great, man. It's great to be with you tonight. It's been a long day in the operating room and, uh, you know, just winding down a little bit here at the office. I know you guys have been crazy. Tell me about your procedures today. What, what do you work? What were you working on today? Um, I had a chronic uh, triceps rupture that was uh, a challenge. You know, it was ruptured for about a year and a half and I had to try and bring it back down to the electron and um, I got it there. So it's good. Was it similar to Seth Ferrosi? Because I know Seth had, didn't he also? Well, he was acute. I actually saw him like the night he did it. He came over to my office and then uh, I did the surgery, I think maybe a day or two later. And uh, it's a lot easier to repair when you get in there and fix it right away. But it's been retracted and it's up in the arm for that long. It's uh, It can be a real challenge to bring it down. I do a little tendon lengthening and um, I think it's going to go okay. Yeah, but he'll well, be stiff because... Cool. We got to keep them straight for a long time just to, you know, get it to heal and not rip it off. So, well, when you're doing that, first of all, I know Seth's looking great. I mean, he's, I think, on well on his way to recovery. So, great job on that, brother. I know that um, he, you know, obviously as not really competing anymore, but he's very active in terms of in the gym and he's all, all of that. And so it, it, it's, it's devastating when some people have to run, you know, deal with injuries. And I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, when you're dealing with these athletes, are you dealing, how much of these guys are guys that are bodybuilders that are competing versus like, what, what are you seeing mostly? Because I know that you have a quite a bit of bodybuilders that come see you, but is it mostly bodybuilders or is it just like everyday people as well? Well, well, of course, I mean, the majority of my practice is everyday people, but um, I do see a lot of the bodybuilders in the area for both their injuries, whether it be arthritis from training for a long time or whether it be an acute injury or chronic just tendonitis, whatever. Um, but I also see a, a ton of bodybuilders for the wellness side of the practice. Um, the majority of my day though, will be people who aren't, um, but the, the majority of the people who come in that are weightlifters that, that enjoy bodybuilding are followers of Seth or whoever. Um, and they are just, you know, recreational lifters and you know, they may be doing some sauce or whatever, but, um, they, are, you know, the, the, a lot of the biceps I see, you know, biceps and um, quad tendons are people who are actually, you know, on the job when they hurt it. Um, Picking something up, weights. something. Yeah. Do, do you see that? Because that's what I used to see. Like I used to see guys that were professional bodybuilders or professional athletes that would tear a quad and not necessarily always in the gym or tear a bicep, but picking up a TV or doing something that was really strange and just all of a sudden. Um, I had a good one where a guy was at work. They had a, uh, a, a car wash there and they had those big spinning things, you know, right. Mm -hmm. And he's, he does a bet with his buddy and he says, I'm going to hang on to this spinning thing while it's going, while the car wash is running. So he gets on it and it starts spinning. And of course, yeah, they yanks him right off and uh, he tears his bicep. And in yeah, fact, well, he was a bodybuilder and, and unfortunately he passed not too long ago. It was, uh, it was a pretty sad thing too. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, with all these people passing, uh, was that recently too? Was that, was that recent? No, it was, um, a couple of years ago now. Okay. Okay. With all yeah, these people passing. It's very sad for the whole community in the area because he was loved by everybody too. Well, and that's tough as it is, but now everybody's asking me, and this is why I wanted to also be able to speak to not only a medical professional like yourself, but also somebody who was an active IFBB pro competitor as well as an IFBB judge, but somebody who has a reference point, um, you, you got a really specific uh, just opinion that I'm sure what's going with what's going on right now. 
with uh, these deaths that are going on and it's tragic. And I, I really want to get your opinion on this because I obviously am, have been speaking out much, much more about this more than I ever have because I feel like I need to. But I also think that, that my opinion is one thing because of experience and because of all the people that I've worked with. But at the same time, it's a, it's a bit different. I would like to try to get your opinion as a medical professional. What do you think is going on right now with the state of all of these people having heart attacks and having all of these issues. What do you think is the root of the cause? Because it seems like the frequency has gone up quite a bit. Yeah, that's that's a big question. Um, I think what's going on right now that is most important is that conversations are being had. So like this conversation is occurring, which I think is the best part of what's going on right now. Uh, If you look at it from the positive side, the negative side is, yes, there's a number of people who are passing. Some of them are current competitors and some of them are previous past competitors. And uh, there seems to be some common themes to how they're passing. Um, but uh, that being said, we don't know what's happening in each of these cases. We don't have all of the information. We don't know what their past medical histories were like. We don't know what their current medical histories are like, whether they um, had COVID or whether they um, were, you know, previously treated for heart disease or have a family history of heart disease, all these different things. So we can't draw any direct conclusions as to what is going on, but I can tell you what I know seems to be happening in a good majority of the cases, because from what I've heard, majority of those cases have been cardiovascular disease related, um, whether it be um, blood clots versus um, uh, heart attacks. So, um, you know, there's a lot of theories and, and, and I'll tell you in my own practice, the most commonly underappreciated problem in bodybuilders who use steroids is polycythemia. Okay. And polycythemia is basically you have an increase in your red blood cell count and, um, it, it causes your blood to be thicker. You know, your hematocrit is high. You have less plasma compared to the amount of red blood cells. And so your blood is thicker. And so that can cause a form of sludging. Um, and if you add any other types of insults, to your system at that time that would increase the risk of bleeding, I'm sorry, clotting, um, you would have things like trauma to uh, blood vessels, um, any hypercoagulable states. Um, These kinds of things um, can come in many forms, whether it be genetic, whether it be something that's induced by a virus per se, um, or, you know, travel, Um, so when we talk about the thickening of the blood, it causes a number of problems, right? You get this sludging, Mm -hmm. which affects how your kidneys read your blood pressure. And uh, just like how the musculature of the arteries going to the kidneys could hypertrophy from steroids as well, and cause, uh, um, the same lack of blood flow to the kidneys, you can then see a rise in blood pressure. Okay. Um, I think you've probably seen people like this who are on like high doses of anadrol and things, and they're just plethoric and they're just, their faces are red all the time. They're, you Absolutely. know, bloodshot. Um, this, this look is a real big problem when you see it because the blood pressure is usually high. The hematocrits are almost always high, right? You know, people like to have this vascular look. Well, that's a lot of times happening because of the polycythemia you're getting this right. same thing happening. So, you know, um, I think that's being missed a lot because I just have patients every day that I see it in even my own testosterone replacement patients. If you're under the age of 50, you're, you're going to get polycythemia on testosterone. Right. And let's just, I'm going to pause right there. I think, I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast, even though you're only taking an HRT dose, let's just say the typical dose, which is 200 milligrams a week right? Of, of so that, and that's of, even high compared to the typical dose, but that's what a lot of bigger guys feel better on. And that's consistent with my practice. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if we're talking a couple hundred milligrams of testosterone, sipinate or an anthate is, is kind of, again, I'm, I'm kind of generalizing here. You're going to see some people do one shot every 14 days, every, um, or as little as every seven days, depending on blood work and how that comes back when you're doing that just by itself, which is supposed to be quote unquote, an HRT dose, you can have your hematocrit up in the mid fifties and with just that. And that's obviously, you know, the spectrum from most labs. And you can let me know if I'm, you know, incorrect, or if you want to adjust uh, any of these numbers is anything over 50, 51, 52, you're starting to kind of get like really high at that point. Yeah, right? right on. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to cause that sludge, right? It's basically, it's going to become thick and viscous and it's harder to pump. So the the heart has to pump harder. So you're going to have a higher resting heart rate and then it can cause blood pressure issues. And then you can also cause, like you said, kidney issues. And that's going to be a cascade effect with just simple HRT if you're not going out. And I guess it's a, you know, basically for a lack of a better term, we call it bloodletting. I think the medical term for it is, um, therapeutic uh, phlebotomy. Yep. Very big. Exactly. And so at the end of the day, what, what happens is you have to check that to be able to bring it down. And not always is the, the case that you're going to end up going down five points with giving a pint of blood. It's usually like one or maybe two. And, and is that, is that pretty accurate with depending on the size of the person and the individual and absolutely. I mean, I have guys who have to do it a lot more often than others. And, you know, there are people who have to do it every two months or people have to do it every quarter. And then there's some that just do it once or twice a year. So it's it, but it's, but it is common and it's probably one in three of anybody under the age of 50 um, that I would have to do. So, and especially if there are bigger guys who need to creep up a little bit higher to titrate to their good libido, which is what we do with testosterone. I mean, the most important thing is to, is to get that libido back. And if we don't have that, that sex drive isn't there, then uh, we can titrate it up a bit. Um, sometimes we get to that, that upper end and even you know, exceed that upper end. If it takes that to get a little bit more of that feeling and that can end up with these other problems. And some people kind of beg to get their sex drive back and that's what we do. But um, we're always safe about everything else around it. And so side effects uh, of increasing your dose and side effects of conversion of testosterone to estrogen and, and DHT, um, which we're also watching very closely all the time. When it comes to, you know, the triple threat of things, though, you talk about that, uh, that sludging, the hypertension, um, you add in now something like anadrol, winstrol, any of these oral anabolics, now you're talking about a severe drop in your HDL cholesterol, mm -hmm. which is really a sign of, you know, the liver damage. It's, um, uh, it's very common to, um, see some elevations in liver function tests with those, those drugs. So now you've got this low HDL and this, this mixed hyperlipidemia scenario, um, where, well, the, also the anti-estrogens will do that too, right? We'll, well I was going to get, I get to that. It's the triple threat here. So we yeah. got the, the polycythemia, we've got the, the effects on the liver, and then we've got the, the estrogen effects and especially trying to mitigate those effects, um, can be really bad in, in a number of reasons. Um, so even the anti-estrogens can reduce your HDL and affect your lipids. The the main thing that I think is missed a lot with the antiestrogens is its effect on your joints and your tendons. Um, you know, women are known to have a lower rate of biceps tendon tears and quadriceps tendon tears than men up till the age of 50. You know, when they start to go through menopause and when their estrogen drops off, their risk of heart attack, their risk of um, having a tendon tear increases fairly exponentially. So it's that loss of estrogen in that time that is the, the, the factor that's happening. And so if you basically take a bodybuilder who says, oh, you know, I'm getting gyno, so I'm going to just hit letrozole really hard. I'm going to hit a Remedex. I'm going to do whatever. Um, and they're just crushing their estrogen to levels that are undetectable. You're talking about some pretty significant increases in risk to your vascular endothelium, 
you know, lost of the elasticity of your tendons. And um, so in, in my experience, you know, I, I, I published a study about, um, gosh, it's been eight or nine years ago, looking at all of my Achilles tendon rupture patients that came in from the beginning of my practice, because this has always been of interest to me, of course, being a bodybuilder. Um, I looked at all the Achilles tendon ruptures and we found a significant correlation to low testosterone levels mm. and its effect on uh, having a higher rate of tendon rupture. So we found things like an undescended testicle. We found, the guy didn't even know, which was kind of weird. Um, and then there was the uh, uh, patient with, um, there have been multiple patients with pituitary tumors um, that we have found in, in, that, in that particular study. So um, the key there is that we can't keep crushing our estrogen because estrogen is important. And if you're going to use the anti-estrogens, we're going to work on kind of keep you in a range. that's a little bit more normal, like whether right. it be 30 to 60, I let it creep up to 60 as long as you're not having symptoms. So, um, if we can keep you in that range, um, instead of making it undetectable, uh, sure. it's probably much safer for you. And I think that the other thing that people re need to realize too, is that, that also helps with making sure that we end up, um, really creating an environment for you to be able to get a pump. People don't realize when you crush estrogen, your pump, your fullness, all of those things are, um, you know, your sex drive. When you go too low, all of those things are affected. Is it not doc? I mean, you know, yeah, obviously you're, right. I, you're I, absolutely know. right. There's a nice balance between all those hormones. And when you start, you know, making it so unbalanced towards one or the other, I mean, especially you throw in something like Prostar and, and then all of a sudden you have, you know, no sex drive. It's, it's, you know, you lose that DHT side of things. You lose the, the, the aggression in the gym. Some people try to knock that out. So, um, then you're, then they go into that circle that, that of, of taking drugs to counteract other drugs. And, uh, again, the pro scars really, a lot of people use that for hair. They're trying to, you know, mitigate, you know, loss of hair. So they're, they're trying to do that on the physical side, but sometimes they're trying to do, reduce the five uh, DHT on the hormonal side. And so then there's always a cascade effect when it comes to hormones and being that you also not are only an orthopedic surgeon, but you're also uh, have, you know, do wellness and testosterone replacement therapy in, in your practice as well. Do you see people that are just constantly, because that's what I see, right? When I, when I deal with athletes, these people go down these, these rabbit holes of just throwing one thing after another and it, yeah. And it's, 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 it's just, I just, do you see that all the time as well? It's not only that they're chasing the side effects of overuse of everything. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different things about that side of it. I mean, people are using underground gear. They're using things that they don't know what the real doses are of that gear. So, you know, you see guys come in they're saying they're taking 1200 milligrams of testosterone and they get their labs checked and either they're not, or they're taking too much or something. So, um, yeah, that Seth Seth, talked, by the way. Yeah. I was going to say, we just brought up Seth together. Seth, I remember we got something tested and he, it, it was like nothing. It was, we, yeah, we got I tested ready him before his surgery and it was zero. And he said he was on 500 a week. So you, you just, go. that just shows you how genetically gifted he is. <laughs> it happened during a show. It happened during a show a long time ago and the same thing happened and he got it checked out. He went and got some gear checked out and he said that he goes, honey, you won't believe this. He goes, you're right. Remember how you said something is wrong. I went and got it checked out and it was supposed to be 200 milligrams and it ended up being like 30. And it oh yeah, I mean, this was bad. I mean, his, his levels were uh, just ridiculously low. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So it happened um, again. It, it's, just, it happened again to him. So it happened again. Yeah. And he talked about it on his podcast, so I can mention that. But, um, you know, uh, it was eye opening for him, too, because we put him into doing therapeutic phlebotomies and he had never done that before. And um, I'm like, and now he's doing it very regularly. So all that being said, you know, we've we've got 
people chasing that uh, the side effects that are using different drugs that they've never even heard of or that they don't even know what they are. They're using um, these Pep- peptides, peptides and, yeah, that are yeah, coming out yeah. of nowhere. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, we're, we need to talk about that. Doc. I'm getting hit up all around the world. These peptides are a major, major concern. And I think that just so that we can kind of organize everybody here who's listening to this podcast, because I really want to try to get all of the listeners here. So one thing I, w- I do want you to know is that I'm trying to make sure that they I'm trying to dispel as many myths as possible out there and mitigate as much risk for these bodybuilders that are out there. And they think that, oh, um, this guy, this Phil Heath or Hadi or this guy, or, you know, I'm, I'm using names of people who I've worked with, but must be doing these crazy things. So therefore I'm going to do it because somebody in the gym told me that, you know, he's got to turn around and, and get something from the mountain that Batman got the purple flower from, and he needs to crush it up and inject it into his eyeball. I mean, there's a bunch of different weird, weird things going on and, and being again, you're not only a bodybuilder, but you're also a medical doctor. Let's talk about these things that are like SARMs as well as peptides and how bad they are for these athletes. Because when you, I, and I do seminars around the world and I explain to these athletes who are constantly using these things as, as a crutch because they're more quote unquote available when there is no research that shows any of these things are going to help quantify a good result. Uh, when you take testosterone, testosterone has been around for 60, 70 plus years. When it's in you, your body. It's been around forever. <laughs> well, it's been around, but I'm talking about even the synthetic version, right? It's it, It's been around, okay? Nandrolone's been around a, a lot. A lot of these other derivatives of testosterone have been around with st- safety studies and dosages, and they're they're made by pharmaceutical companies, and they're not I, underground. I use Nandrolone in my hormone replacement therapy all the time to help mitigate you know, the conversion of uh, testosterone to estrogens and and DHT. So, you know, they, these are, you're absolutely right. They're very well studied, but these peptides we're seeing, yeah. you know, there's the majority of things that people are saying other than IGF one and, and growth hormone, right. Have no human studies, no human clinical trials. Right. So when you start seeing MCJJ and CCG and, and you know, every other three letter, you know, with a bunch of numbers at the end, and it says not for human use on the bottle, or, or worse yet, there's pictures of uh, peros and gatos on the bottle, maybe, you know, cats and dogs sometimes. I mean, there's, we, we see the, all these weird things, but it's literally not for human use. Are you starting to see any of those side effects? Because I honestly think part of what the reason has also been with so many different people having a decline in their body and these rare diseases and these autoimmune diseases that are sometimes happening with some of these athletes are because they're starting to use these peptides and SARMs and all of these things. But I wanted to get your take on that because again, that's my theory is that's also being added in to these cocktails at ungodly dosages of, uh, you know, that again, that are not needed, but what's your thought? What's your thought? Well, so there's a lot of things that you just said there that are actually very insightful. The, the autoimmune side of things is, is important um, because if you're injecting a peptide that is, supposedly in your body already if it is if you're actually injecting it and there's no studies to show that you don't produce antigen it doesn't have an antigen response where you start becoming um you know like it's almost treating it like a vaccine to you where you're now becoming sensitized to that that peptide um you know your body could start attacking that peptide wherever it is in your body that's first of all, that's why we do studies. That's why there's like tons of studies that are done for the FDA to find out if there's anything like that. Uh, especially when you're talking about different peptides in, in that respect, you can end up having an increase in hypercoagulability and increased risk of blood clots. So that, that that's one thing. I mean, just there's no studies on the majority of this stuff that they're throwing out there. Number two is is what you're getting actually real? I mean, how many times can you go to a peptide site and see something for 30 bucks that if you were to buy it from Sigma Aldrich to use in a clinical study of some kind or an animal study of some kind where it's thousands of dollars to get a purified version of that peptide because it's very hard to produce or something like that. So you think that any of this stuff is real? 
And then the next part of it that I see happening in patients is that they will come in and say that they were prescribed this from a doctor, you know, BPC, whatever. I was prescribed this. This comes from tailor-made compounding pharmacy. This must be the real stuff. Now, first of all, that pharmacy is doing something illegal by selling you a misbranded drug. You know, this is basically one that's never been through FDA testing and doesn't have any reason to be in an FDA approved facility. So if you're saying you're getting it from a compounding pharmacy of any kind, then you're probably getting it from a pharmacy that's already breaking the law and I wouldn't trust them to begin with. Okay. So then you see um, like stuff coming in the mail and stuff that's uh, you, you, they, the patients bring them in. They're like it's all this sediment and stuff in them. And you they're go, cooked. it's all it, like, you're, you're like, it's it, like, it ships you think that those protein, those proteins that are in those peptides are, are not denatured or they're not like completely destroyed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really one of these crazy things that, um, that, people are getting away with and selling this stuff to people who think that they're going to do something. And the placebo effect is very strong. I mean, in, in studies, it's up to 30% of good results from placebos um, where, you know, if you don't have a randomized controlled study to see that, you won't uh, understand what the placebo effect is. But in the Plus end- they're mixing it up. Uh, doc, this is the other issue. They're mixing it with so many different things. You don't know what's working at that point either. So when you're sitting there- and Even if sh- it is real stuff, let's just say it is real and they're injecting it. And you're, you put it, we don't know what's happening with that at all. Right. So it, it's very scary, the whole peptide market, because um, it's worse than the SARMs market because, you know, like I said, you're, you're getting things that have never been tested in humans. Now, at least some of the SARMs have been, and a lot of them haven't passed the, you know, the, the, the sniff test to get into, um, into human use. So have you seen some, any of those patients that are, um, saying, Hey, look, I'm having issues and I found out that I'm taking peptides. Have you had it? seen those those patients so here, here's here's the issue that occurs people feel like they're superman because they're taking it and so um or superwoman for that matter because I'm, I'm seeing it in both you have people who say i i think i have a rotator cuff tear so i've been taking bpc whatever mm-hmm. and um i think it's healing and i think it's good i'm not going to do surgery I'm, i don't think i should do surgery on my rotator cuff because uh, i'm going to get it to heal with this and the problem is, is that these tears get worse you know, they get progressively worse over time. If you're taking roids and you have some kind of anti-inflammatory effect occurring from it or a pain relieving effect that can occur with taking steroids, um, you're ignoring it and it's progressing. And then by the time they decide, oh gosh, this is really bad and nothing has really worked, um, then they need surgery and it's a much more challenging problem and a much longer rehab and, you know, more mobilization and, uh, is there anything out there that you have any kind of treatments where if you have a minor, like I, I tore my rotator cuff, but it was in a car accident. So it was severe enough where I had my orthopedic surgeon, which is literally across my parking lot who worked on my ACL do my rotator cuff. Um, but the, is there those minor tears? I mean, just being that we're on that subject right now that you, what is there's platelet therapy or anything like that, that you feel that that can actually rejuvenate the area to the point where you're no longer having an injury. Is there anything like that? So, I mean, obviously I do this every day with regards to, you know, in my office, I probably do five or six PRP injections Mm -hmm. um, at a time. Sometimes we we see quite a bit of it. uh, And I do believe in the biologics of it. And there's good science to support it for things like tennis elbow or, um, you know, plantar fasciitis or, you know, chronic patellar tendonitis and arthritis, um, like platelet rich plasma is great for arthritis pain. Um, it's been shown to be better than cortisone and hyaluronic acid in a couple of studies. So from the perspective of using it for healing something, like, let's say you come in with a rotator cuff tear, well, it depends on everybody's rotator cuff tear is different right? You could have a partial tear. You could have a retracted tear with atrophy of the muscle. You could have, um, any combinations of the four muscles torn. 
So, and, and the biceps, the long biceps is well involved. So you end up with um, not having a consistent, you know, way of, you know, quantifying between the two, unless you say, okay, I'm going to take a study and I'm going to look at, you know, partial tears of the supraspinatus that are not um, retracted. And you're, you, they're actually uh, partial from the point that there's maybe a articular sided or a, you know, subacromial sided tear. And um, you say, okay, I'm going to take these partial tears and I'm going to inject them with PRP mm -hmm. and we'll see how they do. Well, I'll tell you, for the most part with those patients, they, they do very well, as long as it's not a tear that's been pulled off the bone. If it's been pulled off, there's nothing that's going to bring it back on but surgery. Right. You know, it's not like you're going to put something in there that's all of a sudden going to fill the gap in. So Once the muscle has lost that tension uh, being on the humeral head, you, you basically end up with the loss of that you know, length tension relationship and, mm -hmm. um, and the muscle doesn't work. So then, but what you can do, let's just say you do have a small partial tear that's like actually the, you know, full thickness partial tear and um, you want to augment it with PRP. Well, what you're doing is trying to, number one, reduce the inflammation that's occurring as a result of it, because that's what mm -hmm. PRP does. Right. And number two, it may augment some collagen responses in the remaining tendon that's intact. It may address the tendinopathy in the portions that aren't torn and maybe reinforce that part. So, you know, sometimes it's worth a try on the smaller tears and then you watch them closely with an ultrasound on their follow-up visits and things, and maybe another MRI and you make sure that it's not progressing because have you ever seen that though? Have you ever seen it where it's a small partial tear, but in a PRP has ever gone back to where it almost looks normal again. And you can actually see it getting that much better through an MRI after the fact. Um, when you have a small partial articular sided or, you know, uh, otherwise tear, I have seen improvements in the MRI. We've seen improvements in the, um, uh, the quality of the tendon, uh, mm -hmm. and surrounding tendon and lack of less bursitis and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, I, I'm speaking anecdotally too. I mean, th whether you have a lot of studies that show that there's not, um, I mean, in animal models, it's been shown that you can improve the quality of the tendon. So, I think so you have, you do, do you, do you also, I mean, do you also, when you go in and you fix a rotator cuff, do you automatically go and do PRP on there too? I do PRP on all of my tendon repairs yeah. in every surgery that I do, whether That's it's Achilles, show, whether it's yeah. tricep, whether it's bicep or, um, I've been using it since I started my practice in 2008, 2007. Um, and, um, I've always been a big fan of using it for not only, you know, hopefully getting better tendon quality, which we've seen happen in rotator cuff repairs, as well as mm -hmm. um, Achilles repairs, but also it reduces pain. It controls the inflammation. Um, it controls bleeding. It also um, it improves wound healing. So in Achilles tendon surgery, we have, there was one study that showed that there was an improvement in the healing of the incision, which can be really problematic in Achilles because it's a very thin skin in that area. So if we're worried about, uh, wounds, it's great. So, um, you know, using biology to heal is, is awesome. Um, your own biology is the best, you know, that we also use bone marrow aspirate concentrates, which some people, and even myself, I used to call stem cells, but it's really not stem cells. Um, what it is, is concentrated, um, hematopoietic nucleated cells. So that means that you're getting stem cells, you're getting, um, you know, the meat, the, the cells that are already going on to the different lineages. So you have cells that are creating blood vessels, you have cells that are creating uh, tendon, collagen, this and that. So um, if you take, if I take your bone marrow and I test it for stem cells, about one in 50 to a hundred thousand might be like a pluripotent stem cell that can become anything. So, or an omnipotent potent one, you know, for that matter. So if you look at it, the biology of that tissue that you're injecting, if you're taking the bone marrow aspirate concentrates and you're putting that around a bone defect, or you're putting it around a rotator cuff or whatever, 
yeah, you're enhancing the biology of the area by bringing in some of these nucleated cells. So um, there's really good use of that. And studies have shown that doing your own bone marrow aspirate concentrate is also great for arthritis pain. Uh, it's not a whole lot different than the PRP. So we always start with PRP um, and then go on to that because it's very expensive to do the bone marrow aspirates, the devices that we have to get. I mean, the yeah, material PRP costs, is definitely cheaper. I know from all the time that I spend to do these in my office, the bone marrow aspirates, it's, um, it's just a lot more time and set up and um, the kits that I have to bring and the, the rep from my company brings in their, their um, centrifuges and device. So, uh, and it's a cell sorter. So it's a really pretty good technique. Uh, what I'm seeing a lot of in this area, which has been really problematic and it's happening probably everywhere is this umbilical cord stem cells or exosomes or things like that, where people think they're actually getting something that's real. And I'm going to tell everybody that's listening today that when it comes to, um, these particular scenarios, I mean, there's a chiropractor down the street that brings in a nurse practitioner and they thaw a vial of what's called stem cells or exosomes even. Um, and, and the stem cells that are in that vial have been transported um, across the country from Utah or somewhere. And then they were frozen to begin with and then you thaw them out and then you inject them. So I worked in a stem cell lab. I worked on muscle drive stem cells. Uh, when I was a resident, I spent a whole year in fellowship doing stem cell research. And I can tell you having to have plate, you know, do the plating of those stem cells to grow them up and whatever. I mean, they are super sensitive. As, as soon as you jostle them up a little bit or you put them in the wrong temperature or you put the wrong serum in their cell culture, they turn into something, usually a fibroblast. Like they just become scar. You know, uh, if you give them the right growth factors, you can get them to turn into muscle cells and we were able to do that. Um, but, but seriously, if I mess something up when I was learning about it, they would become scar. Doc, let me, let me, let me interrupt you real quick, because I think what I want the listeners to be able to take away, because again, I, I, this is the truth podcast, but I want to make sure that a lot of these competitors or trainers that listen to my podcast really what I think they would really want to know is number one, and, and we don't have to get into too, too, too much you know, of, of the technical aspect of it, but when you have a partial tear, let's say you're benching, right. And I'm, I'm a huge uh, person, you know, I'm, I'm very anti barbell bench because anybody I know who's done barbell bench, it's probably where you're getting all the, all the, all the tears it's, in the past. It's called the ego press. There's That's no right. reason to do it. There's <laughs> there absolutely go. no reason to do it. So the only reason why I do it is because that girl down the, in the, in the gym is going to walk by and you got to show how, or, or some other guy you want to press, you know, like I'm stronger than you kind of thing. Um, there's no reason to flat bench unless you're doing it as a competition. Right. And at the end of the day, that's why I don't ever have them built out on my programs, especially with the pro bodybuilders who get really strong because I do not like barbell presses. I like, you know, dumbbell presses because you're, if you're going to tear your pec anywhere, it's going to be on a barbell bench press. That's where you're going to tear your pec. But that being said, if somebody We're trying to do 500 pounds on an incline, which there's that one video. That oh guy, yeah. That guy well, was yeah, a pretty yeah, bad one. Yeah. That was a really bad one. I cringe every time I think about that one. He, um, but if something happens where let's say you have a tear or a partial tear, or you turn a little bit black and blue, tell the audience, what is the best way to go about trying to deal with that? Like, is there, is there something acutely that you can do? Is there something like, you know, what's the triage process? Like, do you do normally like somebody to turn around and do ibuprofen right away or ice or what are the things? And, and trying to mitigate the pain at that point, if there is a lot of pain, now, I tore my bicep, I had no pain whatsoever. I mean, it was like, Ooh, yeah, I knew I did it. It was a loud crack. And I'm like, Oh damn, I know exactly what happened. Popped it up on the rings and I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm never going to yeah, be able to rings know that you were also a gymnast, you know, so, so that's what you're doing. But so, so would you, do you recommend though, do you recommend anti-inflammatory NSAIDs, like whether it's ibuprofen or naproxen sodium or anything sure. like that? The trick with that is that if you think you're going to be able to get in for surgery in the following week, you don't want to be taking a lot of ibuprofen and then have higher, you know, platelet dysfunction going into a surgery. One okay. of the biggest problems that I have in my practice, which annoys the crap out of me is somebody breaks their ankle, they go to the ER, they put them in a little splint and they say, here, take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen every six hours. Right. And I got to operate on them the next day and they've just taken all this ibuprofen. 
after we tell everybody to stop your ibuprofen before your elective surgeries, right? Right. So, so what should they do if, if it's a tear, if it's a major tear, you're saying, don't do it. Go see the doctor. Do, do uh, ice a minimal, it up, you know, if you can up. put some ice on it, you okay. can, um, you know, limit whatever activity you're doing with that. Now you, you, uh, if you know, you fully tore it, like it popped completely off your bicep, your muscle retracted, your bicep is up in the air. You can't hurt it anymore. So right. you can use your arm, you can do whatever. Um, but if it's a partial tear and you don't see the deformity, you don't know if it's completely pulled off, you want to mm-hmm. try and save as much of it as you can. So I wouldn't like. You know. So what do you do at that point? Do you take, take some ibuprofen at that point? Do you recommend? If you have a partial tear? Yes. If you guys yeah, you, you, you can, you I'm not saying you can't do ibuprofen and things. You can do that for the pain. That um, is that nice is fine. And wrapping things is good for some pressure. So you don't get some big, uh, you know, bruising and bad bleeding and stuff. But, um, you know, even if you do use the ibuprofen and things, we can always delay your surgery by a bit. Like I said, I fixed a guy whose tricep was ruptured for over, <laughs> over a year. So right. you can, you can do that. Um, and just kind of delay your surgery a little bit if you feel like you don't want to take that risk. So all that being said, get in to see a doctor right away. Got it. If you think you yeah. tore something, come go see, see me. Yeah, go, go <laughs> you see know what I mean? you if you're in the area, in the Pittsburgh area, go see Dr. Victor Prisk. Or if you're somewhere else, then get in and see your doc. The other thing is going, going back full circle, doc, and because again, with all the issues going on with all these people passing away, I want to talk a little bit about how to mitigate things. Okay. How we can mitigate. So, um, I have my athletes use, you know, omega supplements, uh, omega three fatty acids and whatnot. Um, and again, that helps with a little bit of the blood, but is that something that you also like? Is that something that you also recommend? So here's the, the very fish first oils thing. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, Certainly there's different levels of competitors, different programs that people are doing, whether they're doing it naturally or versus bringing things in. If you ever decide to bring things in this gear and whatever, you need to have regular labs. Mm -hmm. You just need to do it. You should have labs from the start. So you know where you're coming from to make sure there was nothing that would put you at risk. If you were to start doing this stuff. Um, and then if you do start doing it, you should get regular checkups with labs. You may want to do it every six weeks just for a while, especially if you're using any orals, you you definitely want to get those labs and see what the effect is on your lipids and your, your, uh, more so your liver function tests. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, you got to take it all into consideration what your doctor can do with regards to your, um, family history of heart disease, your family history of cancers, your family history of this and that. So, you can have a better sense of, you know, what risks you're taking. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about labs. Okay. So we're talking about, let's just say, let's start off with the basics. Let's do a full chemistry panel, right? Yeah. So, so we're going to go full chemistry panel, a comprehensive metabolic panel. Okay. Comprehensive metabolic panel. There you go. And so, um, comprehensive metabolic panel will give you everything from your AST to ALT, which is your liver function. Um, it's going to be your creatinine. It's going to be your blood glucose will usually be on there as well so that you can see where your fasted blood glucose is. Um, uh, I guess. And the other thing is creatinine. Let's talk just a a single second about that. I think some people are a little bit confused about creatinine levels and no and understanding because if you don't get a tra- properly trained doctor who's a bodybuilder <laughs> then you're going to get somebody who's going to freak out i've had doctors freak out they go you take creatine you're crazy you're nuts i mean it happened literally it's one of the worst me. things yeah yeah and and, and, and people that these docs freak out about creatine and things it's they think it's steroids or something yeah it's like it's steroids and your liver is going to i mean your uh, kidneys are, are going to shut down I mean, all this stuff that. you can't they tell you kids can't even take it when there's so many studies showing just the, like the the benefits you know creatine between creatine and whey protein those are the two most important supplements in the regimen of any athlete they are proven safe to do in young athletes they are proven safe in, at all levels. And they also, there was always these, these, um, news stories you would hear about this kid playing football and dehydrating. Mm-hmm. Was it because of, and they could blame it because it was creatine. There was this one article where they, uh, I read where they, uh, said creatine was the same as growth hormone steroids. <laughs> I mean, it was so bad. 
I mean, some of these things, but yeah, you know, the, the, the creatine is going to be converted to creatinine in your system. It gets converted in water. If you put cre creatine in water at all, it becomes creatinine. So that's why you can't get, you know, good quality creatine in a, you know, water soluble form. You know, it's just, you're better off using the creatine monohydrate and that's what the studies show are best and it's cheap. It's easy. So you do that. And then, um, so the creatinine, just talking about that real quick, because you're doing blood work and, and I see people that don't understand that, first of all, when you do that blood work, if you don't have a doctor that's really well-versed, if you've been training hard, which you should take a couple of days off, what's what I recommend. And you can kind of, kind of go, go with me to take a couple of days off of training before, because you can get some high liver functions from like, if you go train legs, you can get some artificially a little bit, a little bit high. So I, I always recommend people doing taking a several days off, um, both supplements that have to contain creatine, but also from training before they give their blood work. Is that something that you would advocate or is there, is there, a, is there a better way of doing that in your opinion? Um, like coming off of pre-workouts and things that create contain creatine just so that you don't get a hard, officially high creatinine level. Um, I mean, you could do that. It, does, it makes sense to kind of do that, but you're, you're going to get higher creatinine levels as a result of just your training. And so if you do a leg workout or something, it's going to be elevated. You could certainly do that. I think that's not a bad idea. Um, you know, if you really wanted to see what your baseline is. Um, yeah. So that, that, that's because I've, I've seen that where some, some clients have gone in there and they train their ass off and they're, you know, taking five or 10, you know, grams of creatine, you know, let's say five gram, grams of creatine a day. And then they go in and see a doctor and then, then the creatine is a little bit high from the training or it's from, you know, they're taking creatine. I normally recommend them coming off of all of those things and not train for two or three days, just, just so you can get a better baseline, properly hydrate, do, you know, make sure that you just are on top of those things. So you don't end up getting any kind of wacky numbers. But, um, so besides the comprehensive, um, you know, the full chemistry panel, the comprehensive metabolic panel, what, you know, lipid panel is also important, right? So we, I'm sure that's another thing where you get a lipid panel and for the, you know, for the listeners, a lipid panel basically is just going to show your good cholesterol, your bad cholesterol. Obviously that needs to be fasted. You need to be fasted to do that. Like most of this blood work usually is you got to be fasted, which means you don't eat, you stop eating, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, the night before. Um, and I am besides that, when you have uh, you know, these patients come in, they do a total test, a free test level. Cause you're trying to show baseline, especially before they start their HRT process. So they're doing a total and free test, I'm assuming. Well, yeah. So before we go into the hormone mm -hmm. replacement side of it mm -hmm. and those labs, you know, there's still a lot of the healthy side of things. So okay. we have already talked about, you know, checking your hematocrit, you know, that's going to be a key too, but maybe even just getting a full, uh, comprehensive, um, uh, blood count, um, mm -hmm. just so that you're, complete blood CBC? Count so you, can, you can, yeah, your CBC. So you can find out and even with diff, so you can see if, you know, you're already starting from a place of, um, you know, high platelets, you know, increased risk of clotting, you know, if you, if you have, um, any sort of abnormalities in your, um, in your lymphocytes, you know, you're looking at, um, lymphocytes and neutrophils and you're, you, just gotta, you want to look for the balance in everything. Um, we want to make sure that hopefully when you get your results back, you want to try to be in normal. That's the thing. So when you, when you get your lab scores back, you know, you want to make sure nothing is too high or too abnormally low. And so that basically you, you check boxes because most doctors also recommend doing this in general for a standard yearly checkup when you go in and do your blood work, but as a lot of bodybuilders and athletes think that they're in such great shape that they don't need to do these kind of regular things that people do. Um, and that's one of the fallacies of, of bodybuilding is that, ah, I work out all the time. I'm doing two hours of cardio a day. I'm doing this and that, you know, uh, I'm healthy. What, what the heck? So it's that mentality that's going to get you in trouble the Superman mentality or the fear that if they get the labs are going to have to stop. You know, and some things, you know, some people just ignore the fact that if I do this and that, it's going to, I know it's going to do something to me. So I don't want to know. I just don't want to know. It's that mentality that gets you in trouble. And so yeah. the ostrich mentality, like putting your head in the dirt, thinking that exactly. And that, and that's the thing. So 
going through and doing the rest of it, do you go through like homocysteine? Do you go through, through C-reactive protein? Is that something where you also want to check those inflammatory markers? I always get markers? a high-sensitive C-reactive protein just to make sure that, um, you know, we, we don't have some excessive amount of cardiovascular risk. Um, sometimes I'll do even omega-3, omega-6 panel to see, you know, just what your ratio is. Um, we know that if your ratio is less than four to one, it's probably a better way to go when it comes to, um, and, you know, cardiovascular health. So yeah, we'll do some of those more specific markers and we'll even do some genetic tests for things like, uh, understanding, you know, how you would respond to Lipitor or if you're going to end up with leg cramps or not, you know, different things that, um, uh, can be of benefit from your overall health, whether it be getting particle sizes in your lipids, things like that. Um, there's, I think everybody's everybody right now, doc is, is asking me because with all these people passing away and getting sick, I think, I think it's, it's, uh, people are starting to get scared straight and I'm, and that's why we're doing this podcast is so that we give them the ability to understand, Hey, these are the things you need to go and do now with the right doctor. You will get sometimes some, some doctors out there. They're going to give some pushback. Well, you don't need to do all these tests or you do do this. You know, there, there's always extremes to physicians, just like there is to everybody. But these are things that I feel that we should share with all of the, the listeners out there so that they go out there and get their blood work done. See how, what their liver, their kidneys, how they're functioning. I think also going out and figuring out, um, doing a cardio stress test, you know, yeah. um, yeah, or at least sure. an EKG just to see, you know, how hypertrophic your heart is and things and mm -hmm. determine whether or not, I mean, whether or not you really need to do a bigger study, you know, you can always get your calcium score, your calcium score CT scan. You can do that if you really want to know, especially in the older guys out there, older guys and gals that want to see just what's going on and what their potential risk might be for having uh, coronary problems. Um, so there's a number of tests. Once you get the initial tests and you go, hmm, maybe I need to look at this a little bit closer. My high sensitivity, you know, CRP has been really high. My lipids are, have been really bad for a while. Maybe I need to start doing some of these other things to look into my cardiovascular health. So, because, because that's where we're seeing most of the problems, right? The cardiovascular health issues, especially in the long term. you know, guys dying young from body, you know, bodybuilding, not when they're in bodybuilding, even the retired guys, it's usually because of the cardiovascular disease issues. So well, don't you think that maybe a part of this also has to do with COVID? Don't you think that COVID can also cause blood clots? Because that's, that's what. We can talk about two things. We can talk right. about what COVID can do mm -hmm. and what you have going on in the bodybuilder. You know, you've already got a bodybuilder who um, may be hypercoagulable, may have this sledging we talked about, uh, may have um, elevated platelets whenever they're, you know, hit with an inflammatory uh, insult. And then we take. COVID, which is known to have inflammatory reactions out the wazoo, you get this, you know, uh, systemic inflammatory response, you uh, end up with all the tissue damage from that, especially in the lungs. And so now you've got getting COVID and having that cytokine storm that happens with it. And then you have what's going on in the background of yourself already. We know that in obese people, people with diabetes that are going to have higher um, rates of cardiovascular disease and higher rates of, um, you know, inflammatory mediators in their body, just because that glucose is just turning, caramelizing all the proteins in your body. And it's making you um, attack that bad looking protein that's been caramelized basically. So that's where the inflammation comes from in diabetes. And so you add on top of that inflammation, the inflammation that's coming from, um, from the, from something like COVID or any other, uh, aggressive virus like SARS or whatever, you end up just, you know, over, over, over stressing the, you know, the immune system to the point where your whole body will shut down. So that being said, also there's the side of it, of the vaccine. We know that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine had this like increased risk of, um, of blood clots. And so yeah, and, and we can't correlate any of COVID vaccines and things to any of the deaths that have happened. We can't, yeah, as far as we know, I mean, some maybe they did have COVID, we, we don't know. But, so when it comes out, 
if, if any of them come out, we can say, oh, okay, we can talk about it, but, or whether their, what their vaccine status was, for instance, we just right. don't know. Well, that's the one thing that, that we do know is that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is definitely one of those that have been really linked to um, higher amounts of blood clots. I mean, you know, it's, it's just, do you think that bodybuilders, if they had to choose between a vaccine, would you tell them, hey, look, man, maybe you should stay away from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine if you choose to get vaccinated? Yeah, I would stick with the Pfizer vaccine is from what I know. But um, it, there's really not, you know, there's no reason for me to say that you shouldn't get the Johnson & Johnson either if you're pretty healthy and you know you don't have the risk. Well, we're talking about bodybuilders here because I guess we don't have, we don't have. Well, there's different levels of bodybuilders, right? And we've got, right. you know, let's say if we're talking about 300 pound guys, uh -huh. you got to be careful what you choose. I would imagine you wouldn't want to do the Johnson and Johnson because of that risk. But if you're talking about, you know, that, uh, that welterweight who's staying healthy most of the year and is, you know, not using much gear and, you know, whatever, or the, you know, uh, bikini competitors and things like that, that may take us a little bit of, Anavar going into a show or something like that, you know, you probably don't have to worry too much about them um, and whatever they do. So it's really an individual choice. It's really, you have to decide what the risks are for yourself. Unfortunately, you're being mandated to do things and then you have to figure out something. And I would still say go with the Pfizer. But um, uh, I think that we have to also realize that just having COVID and not even knowing that you had it because people are often asymptomatic. Um, you know, there can be a response in your body that you don't realize, but it's really going to be, if, if you're having symptoms from it, then that cytokine storm is kind of happening a little bit. So uh, if you have zero symptoms, we don't really know if it's causing an, anything upset in the apple cart at all. You know, is it doing something? Um, but in our experience so far that if, um, if you've been vaccinated in my own hospital, I see this every day. Now we have people coming in and getting tests and they're in the hospital for whatever else. And they have a positive COVID test, but if they've been vaccinated, they don't end up in the ICU. If they're in the ICU, they did not get a vaccine. We have very, very rarely have we ever seen anybody in the ICU who's had a vaccine when they're, you know, in the ICU for COVID that is. So, so the severity of cases you're saying are basically much higher for the unvaccinated. So therefore the people if you're unvaccinated, saying, yeah. Right. The rate of death, the rate of, you know, uh, ICU, um, ventilation, that kind of stuff is much higher. What if you're a bodybuilder and let's say your hematocrit is high, should they wait and let their hematocrit go down if they're unvaccinated so that they can I don't wait? think that'd be a terrible idea. I think going and getting the therapeutic phlebotomy and um, staying well hydrated and avoiding your saturated fats and doing that kind of thing, uh, keeping your vitamin D levels up, um, you know, there's no harm in giving it a little bit of time to get that under control before you go out and get it if you haven't done it already. Okay. So... Yeah, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Now, do you think that uh, obviously with with everything that's going on and with all these different variants and everything that's going on, do you feel that uh, you've seen is there is there people do you feel that are more highly protected if they've already had COVID than someone who maybe decided that they're not going to get vaccinated because that because I hear that a lot too, right? Like where they say, okay, look, I There's don't know if I want shows that you know the having had COVID is probably the best immunity there if your immune system is working. I mean, if you're, if you have a good immune system and you fought COVID and you had some pretty severe symptoms and it went away, you're pretty good at uh, defending yourself from it. Unless whatever it was that made you have bad symptoms is <laughs> still there, whether it be obesity, whether it be diabetes, sure. whether it be heart disease. So, um, I think that, uh, it's, it's good to get it. If you feel like it's safe to get it to yourself, but it's your own personal choice. It's, yeah. Well, I think that also what this, the situation right now is also your weight, right? Just overall weight. Even if you think it's all muscle mass, I think it's such a stress to your body. And, you know, again, this is aside from whether you get COVID or not, just in general, the, the, the pressure of just the body weight on your heart and your organs. Um, can you describe yeah, I look that? At, I look at a guy like, Big Rami and I, I say, man, 
he's just a big dude and he just looks he's slow he's just kind of like wow that's, how do you carry that much weight on that frame you go yeah i worry i worry i do i worry about these guys i, I worry about all of them i mean i mean this is what i do but <laughs> I, I i think uh you know these cycling up and down with your weight the yo-yo dieting kind of stuff the bulking and eating so much food even if you're eating rice and quinoa and couscous and whatever else you're still getting tons of starch and sugar into your system because it's converted you know a lot of this you know rice so like white rice is going to be you know it's pretty high glycemic it gets into your system you get high elevations in your insulin and you know the chances of developing diabetes from just the excess is just there. the food alone is what you're saying. Just, just, just the, the calories, the excess of it. Um, and carrying that kind of weight on your body. Yeah. It's a, it's a big stress on your heart and your kidneys and everything else. So uh, your joints, um, a lot of these guys get worn out joints and don't even realize it because they're on so much gear. They're staying so strong um, that they, they just don't even feel the joint pain until they start retiring. Like, you know, like me, <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah, I think the, uh, the other thing is on the supplement side of that, you know, going back to omegas and baby aspirins and, and all of that, what is your, um, what's your take on, on, on the, on the supplement side to help with, you know, when it comes to the omegas, it's great to do a couple grams of fish oil a day, um, a couple to four grams. And as long as you don't have any other bleeding risks, because sometimes you can get some thinning of your blood with that and get easy bruising and things. But, um, when it comes to taking fish oil, you, you have to think about one thing. Um, are you just throwing a deck chair off the Queen Mary and just pissing in the ocean mm -hmm. because you already have so many omega sixes in your diet? You're like, your ratio is so super high. You're like thirties, forties to one. Um, that if you take a couple grams of fish oil, you think it's going to do anything to that. So you have to have the diet in order, no matter what. So, but yes, adding a couple of grams of fish oil, a couple four grams can be very good for a lot of things. And studies show in improvements in cardiovascular health and things like that. So, um, but if, uh, like I say, you're pissing in the ocean, like, you know, if you're constantly smoking and doing all this other stuff, um, how do you mitigate what's going on? Hold on a second. I think someone's trying to call you. Um, it was a low power mode. It was like a low power warning. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, the, the, uh, what about aspirin? Are you a big advocate on the 81 milligram baby aspirin? I have any uh, GI issues. So I do tell my bodybuilders, my, my, uh, guys who I think are going to be at risk for the polycythemia, mm -hmm. uh, my hormone replacement therapy patients, I'll put them on an 81 milligram aspirin. Okay. And is it, do you do a buffered or does it matter just a baby aspirin? Yeah. An enteric fine? coated, um, aspirin is a good way to go, but, awesome. uh, yeah, just a baby aspirin. Um, but I don't do it for everybody because, you know, there are people who do have some, um, some risks, you know, taking aspirin with regards to the GI tract. Right. Well, and, and, and just, uh, I want to touch on the fact that there are some people out there who chronically or, or just habitually, I should say, use ibuprofen. And number one, I don't think it, 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 I think it hinders muscle size and because you want a, an, an inflammatory response naturally. It hinders muscle size and inhibits muscle healing. I, I did those studies when I was uh, in the lab. Um, okay. We looked at the effects of, we did, you know, muscle injuries, strain injuries, and then we gave animals the COX-2 inhibitors in particular, like Celebrex, um, the stronger ones like Meloxicam, things like that they do slow muscle healing, um, unequivocally. Uh, so yeah, chronic use of it's not going to be good for, for muscle growth. It's going to put more stress on your kidneys and more importantly, um, That's, I remember, I think Tom Prince, uh, ex IFBB pro bodybuilder had that issue. I think he was habitually using ibuprofen or one of the number one causes of acute renal failure is overuse of NSAIDs, um, right. especially in combination with blood pressure medications like lisinopril. Uh, any of the, uh, and, and, you know, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, um, they tend to, um, not respond well to the NSAIDs, which are like ibuprofen, they'll leave, you know, from the proxen. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people realize that they don't realize that the fact that it can actually destroy your kidneys by using some of these, these it's number one cause of, uh, you know, bleeding ulcers and death from. 
Right. And then on the flip side, if you're going to Tylenol, especially if you're chronically using Tylenol, then you're destroying your liver. So at that point, I mean, it's super hepatoxic. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of people out there, you guys, again, if you're using something for a fever or you're using something you know, for a short period of time, um, doc, wouldn't it be just, you know, again, I mean, people are just using it for joint pain and get through their training or for their tendonitis that they're not listening to because they want to get ready for a show. You know, that's when the ruptures and stuff occurs. You're just chronically trying to, you know, hide the symptoms or mask the symptoms and you just. And what can we, what can we, what, what, what can we get the listeners to use? What do you, what do you suggest when it comes to joint pain? Are you a believer in collagen? Are you a believer in, um, con, you know, glucosamine, chondroitin, UC2, any of those different types of, um, so any of those combinations of things that tamarind seed extracts mm-hmm. like, uh, Tamiflex, um, uh, UC2 has some immune modulation effects that have been shown to be good in, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and things. Um, there are some studies that show it's, a, it's, a, it's equivocal between glucosamine sulfate and glucosamine hydrochloride and whether there's any difference in the two or just the quality of the studies. But yeah, yeah, certainly there can be an effect there. I do recommend it to my patients because if they can afford it, you know, the, the only thing is maybe it doesn't work and you're just wasting money. But um, the studies in most of the things that I recommend when it comes from a supplement have good studies to back up one side or the other. Um, you gotta be really careful with some of the studies like UC2, the, a lot of those studies were, were funded for by the company and there's not many independent studies where, um, you know, things have been done, uh, independently. It's just, uh, by, you know, like a, 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 a university that says, I want to find out for sure. Right. You know, it's a manufacturer by a manufacturer for a, for a specific cause. A lot of times. Yeah. Usually that comes up when you have a side effect of some kind, or you have a, a reported, history of, you know, people getting, you know, sick from something or whatever. And, and that's when the universities get involved and do a study to say, is this really safe? You know? Right. Right. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, we, we, we hit the hormones, we hit the, the labs. If someone out there is now really concerned about their health, what else um, besides the, the lipid? We didn't go a lot into the hormones. We kind of skipped over it, but because I kind of want to finish the other stuff, but, Mm -hmm. you know, certainly when you're coming in and you want to check things, the total and free testosterone, we always check the pituitary, depending on where you are with whatever it is you're doing or taking it, especially when you're starting, we look at, um, you know, your FSH and LH, we look at your, um, prolactin level because we want to make sure that you don't have a prolactinoma or something that's causing your low testosterone levels. Um, that's what we found a number of times. And, um, you know, then sometimes we'll check, you know, we'll always check your TSH and your free T4 and free T3. Even, um, there's a conversion, there's a lack of conversion of free T4 to T3. Doc, I was just talking to my wife about this. Let me, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about this. Cause I think this is something where you have some doctors that super over I, I've, I've seen over prescribed thyroid. And I think it's one of those things where one of the just... most prescribed drugs in the world. I mean, between that and the, uh, HMG Quaid reductase inhibitors. I mean, that's probably the two most prescribed medications on the planet, like, or at least in the States, you know, is, you know, Synthroid and Lipitor, you know? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of on the comp on the competitor side, especially the women that the, they, they abuse the hell out of this stuff, whether it's T3, T4 combination, it could be, um, it could be animal based. It could be, you know, whatever it could be. It's a synthetic or animal. They go, I'm going to lose weight. I'm just going to hammer this thyroid. Cause you have these false prophets. I call them these, 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 uh, these gym gurus that are just saying here, take this 50, uh, hundred, 150, 200. Someone had prescribed my wife 200 micrograms of T3 a day. And- <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So that's, four times more powerful basically than the T4. And um, so if you think about, you know, most people when they're on Synthroid for therapy, it's, you know, only around 120 to at the most 200 micrograms. So, wow. Yeah, Yeah. that's, that's incredible. Oh, it was a coach. It was a bodybuilding coach and he didn't really know his dosages right. And he made a big mistake. And then when we started dating, I said, what are you doing? You, you kind of look gaunt, your, your hair is starting to get brittle, all of these weird things were going on. And then, um, again, this is like 15 years ago when, when we first met and it, she's like, 
you know, this is what's going on. I got to get her on the podcast one of these days. Um, she's a doctor of chiropractic and I, I, I just, as you know, she's, and she's a big fan of bodybuilding. She's with me every year at the Olympia. And, um, she's one of those people that just, you know, had competed and was competing. She's getting ready for a show. And I said, what are you doing? And then I look at the packaging and I go, how many of these are you? What, what is this? And she was almost like, I take it. It's all Russian writing, right? It's all Russian writing. And it ended up being a hundred micrograms. And she's taken two of those a day. And, and she, it took her literally over 14, 15 months to get her T3 levels back to normal. And her, she, she, because when she stopped it, because when, once I found out, you know, we, she ended up cutting back and then had to basically titrate off of it. But what ended up happening was she, it took her over a year of not feeling lethargic and getting her body to naturally produce again, because as, as, um, people who are are listening to this podcast are aware of you basically, whenever you're taking some kind of hormone, your body stops making the natural version of that hormone in your body. So her thyroid was completely shot after that. And the thing is the thyroid of all those other, um, you know, glandular, hormone producing organs are basically, they're, they're pretty resilient. They will, the thyroid almost, I haven't had a patient where, uh, unless they had some kind of other condition like Hashimoto's or Graves or something like that, where they weren't able to get their thyroid back online. And it's something that it's something that we can do. And then one of the biggest problems that I see is women who feel like their thyroid is their big problem when yep. they have a normal TSH and they have a normal thyroid hormone levels. Right. And they go, this is why I'm fat. You know, I can't lose weight. And they're not taking food diaries. They're not, you know. Right, right. Yeah, they have other things that are going on. So, or they have adrenal fatigue, or, or it's the adrenal. Yeah, the fatigue. adrenal fatigue thing that gets us right. too. Yeah, that's another yeah. one. Yeah, so, but I think I think that's so. So you have TSH, you have T three, you have T four. You go over those basics, and then so that way, and if you see any red flags on those labs, then you go back and you d- do deeper dives with more precise testing. Is that is that basically? Yeah. So I mean. It, you know, there's that the iodinase dysfunction that occurs with a, you know, a very, very low carbohydrate diet. And so sometimes you'll see the lower T3 in those patients. Um, and, and there can be like a subclinical based on the labs, subclinical hypothyroid going on and sometimes doing a low dose of a very low dose of T3. Um, and those scenarios could be good versus someone who has low T4 and you just want to, and they still convert well. Uh, and they need a little bit of a boost because they are getting brittle nails and their hair doesn't look good. And they are on the upper end of the TSH and mm-hmm. like, Oh, you know what, just, let's just test this to see if it's part of your problem. And we'll do a low dose of, um, Synthroid or T3 and see how you feel. Mm-hmm. And if it really works, then maybe you do need it, you know, uh, maybe we'll do an armor thyroid where you're getting a combo of T3, T4, right. uh, or, you know, we'll, we'll figure out our own ratio T3, T4. So, um, it's, it's definitely something that is useful. Um, and in the general population, it helps control triglyceride levels when they get real high, if your thyroid is low. So, uh, and, and various things, you know, the thyroid is the great facilitator, right? All the other yeah. hormones work if the thyroid is normal. Um, if it's out of whack, it, it screws everything up. Yeah. You start holding water, it, it can really cause a lot of different things. Uh, thyroid yeah, it just... cause carpal tunnel syndrome. It can do all sorts of things. So what else would you suggest uh, these athletes that are really into their health right now to go out and look at? So we have teeth, we, we went over the thyroid, we went over the testosterone. Um, do you do an estradiol? Is that something that you do? Uh, always, baseline? yeah. So always we get our baseline DHT and estradiol levels. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, estradiol, of course, you know, the estrogens are what inhibit the pituitary from making testosterone. So if you're converting testosterone to estrogen, it's the, it's the estrogen that goes back to the pituitary and says, stop making FSH and LH. Mm-hmm. We need to stop. We got too much on board. So um, sometimes uh, we get really good responses in patients that are hypogonadal with, um, with clomiphene citrate. And, and I have a, 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 a ton of patients that are, you know, borderline low testosterone and, or are low and they're young and we put them on clomiphene citrate and we keep them on some long-term maintenance. Uh, if you have a 50 year old guy who doesn't want to do testosterone and you give them some clomiphene and their testes work, they can get up into the thousands. Do you have any problems with the, get the emotional aspect because it binds? You know what? I've always told people to look for that, but because it's like anecdotally out there mm-hmm. and there's some things because, you know, certainly you get an elevation in testosterone. It can affect your, you know, anxiety. It can affect 
uh, your mood. Yeah, your mood in general. So um, we always say to watch out for that. And then, of course, the, you know, washing out for vision changes because there can be this sludging in the, the vessels around in the eye and stuff. So there's that concern. Uh, but I will tell you at 25 milligrams a day or every other day, and even if some of my patients, I get up to 50 milligrams, they haven't complained of it. You know, they've been very good. And it, generally within a few weeks of doing it, they're, um, they're back to good production and feeling improvements in their libido. Uh, they're getting a little bit leaner, that kind of thing. And there are long-term studies showing that you can be on it for a significant amount of time without having any detrimental effects to your bone density and or your cardiovascular. But again, we're talking about 25 to 50 milligrams. We're not talking 200 milligrams like some of these bodybuilders would do where they go absolutely crazy. Well, if you're getting it in a bottle with a dropper on it and you don't know what the heck's in it. I got to say something about that. The dropper bottle stuff that I've seen. When you see thyroid, clenbuterol, these things in these research thyroid, cans. Yes. And what happens with these things, guys, is when, when you're dealing with MCGs, micrograms, and you're using a dropper, it is so inaccurate. It is unbelievable. When you're dealing with Pfizer, Merck, pharmaceutical companies that are making microgram dosages, it's hard for them to get that proper do dosage in a pill. So therefore, they cut it with different types of of ingredients, some, you know, it could be some kind of starch or they use some type of um, just filler to be able to, and flow agents to get something in a capsule or into a tablet. So again, you know, being that I've been in, you know, manufacturing facilities, both pharmaceutical as well as uh, nutraceutical uh, manufacturers, it's really hard to get into the MCGs pr precisely. Now, when you have somebody who's making stuff in their garage out of a dropper and they're supposed to be MCGs, there is no way that it can be properly dosed. So for those of you that are using some underground lab for with, with a dropper on there, you don't know any, I mean, uh, if you're taking 50 micrograms or 20 micrograms of whatever it is, or whether it's like a T3, T4, and uh, you're using this stuff, I guarantee you it's not accurate. I mean, you, you could be taking a thousand times what you think you're taking because- Clenbuterol is another one where it's in microgram dosing and you, you get real big trouble with that one. Yes. Yes. And we're going to get into that too, because I think the fat burners are also some of the things that really can cause a very catastrophic cardiac event. And that, um, you know, so that's the thing, but when we get into, um, the, the other aspects of, is there anything else? I mean, we, we check the estradiols. We want to be, you know, under, you know, 40, 50, you know, no as high, no as high as 60, let's say, I think you mentioned that, but not also making yeah, sure. I think you, you get in the sixties and you're not even, you're not having any side effects. There's really <laughs> not a lot of harm in that, but, um, yeah, I try to keep them around 40 to 60. Okay. Okay. And, and then, and then what else are you usually checking for when you have an initial consultation with one of your patients? What else is, um, is there anything else? Are you using steroid hormone binding globulin or are you? Well, yeah, it's always part of the total and free testosterone to get the SHBG so you can get a sense of things because there are ways we can mitigate, you know, SHBG. And um, so it, that can be another way just to boost your, you know, own free testosterone levels. Free testosterone. So some people, some people have like normal total, but their free is, is kind of low and it could be a high SHBG, whether it's from some medication they're taking or just the way that their liver is functioning. Um, we can certainly do... Um, uh, ways to get around that and kind of boost your free test. It's going to make you feel a lot better. Um, you know, other than that, we do check, uh, I, I do check a resting, a, uh, I'm sorry, a, a fasting AM cortisol level okay. uh, on some people, especially when they're pretty stressed. Now, it's not super helpful, but if we do see a remarkable elevation and I'll check an ACTH as well, just to see if we're seeing a, a, a you know, suppression of it, or a, a, you just, just to get a sense of that pathway. Um, we'll, we'll do that. Um, I think about anything else that I do, uh, regularly, uh, women, I always check a calcium and a parathyroid hormone level, um, vitamin D obviously. And a vitamin D level. I do a vitamin D and a vitamin B12 level just because vitamin B12 kind of helps you understand absorption. Mm -hmm. If you're, um, if you have a low B12 level and you're pretty young and uh, healthy and uh, you're not absorbing it. Uh, if you're not a vegan, that is, um, you 
may have something like Crohn's, you might have celiac disease, you might have something like that. So, we, sure. so we'll, we'll dive into, if you have a really low B, B12 level, I'll, I'll dive into whether it's diet related or it could be GI uh, absorption related. Vitamin D, I tell everybody to take vitamin D no matter what, because around here, not you're not getting any sun. And if right. you don't get it in your diet, you're not getting it from anywhere else. So um, you need to um, supplement with about 4,000. I use a vitamin D3 a day at least. Um, the Institute of Medicine got it wrong when they figured out what our need was for the RDA. They, you know, there were two independent studies that looked at the statistics of the same numbers that they looked at when they tried to determine it, and they were off by tenfold. Also, one thing I also noticed is also absorption of vitamin D, because some people, even though they're taking vitamin D supplements, they don't always absorb them at the same rates as others, because they, you know, they might not be taking them with uh, fatty foods and other foods, certain foods that, that can hinder absorption and other foods that can help with assimilation and, um, and absorption. They're heavier to begin with. They end up just putting it into their fat and then it's not really in their system. But um, yeah, it's a good reason to check, especially if they're low to begin with. You, you know, you have to do some high doses there and maybe an injectable if you really, I don't really need, I haven't had the need to do injectable for D, for vitamin D, but you know, you might need 50,000 I use once a week just to, to give it a little a filling of the reservoir. Mm -hmm. And then what, what do you think about uh, these different types of, um, you know, these fat burners? Like you said, you said talk about clan because I think a lot of people don't realize when you start talking about, there you go. There you so, go. I mean, you got clenbuterol, which mm -hmm. really isn't approved for humans in the U.S. at least. Um, and it's... Uh, if you're overdosing it, we know it's going to cause cardiac damage. You know, it's going to cause scarring. It's, it can cause cardiac hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. It can cause a, a, what's called this diastolic dysfunction, where you just, you're not getting the relaxation of your heart to fill. Um, and it's that diastolic dysfunction that's been thought to be part of, you know, some of the bigger complications of um, things like doing too many marathons, you know, so um, scarring of the heart muscle um, uh, arrhythmias, um, you start throwing in a combination of T3 and clenbuterol and maybe a little extra caffeine. Yeah. A little afibrin all over it. You got a fib, you got, you got, um, PBTs, you know, um, uh, yeah, you got all sorts of bad, bad, bad stuff that can occur. You right. add in some dehydration and you're really set for a disaster, right? Yes. So that's and when that's people are using these things, getting ready for a show, and then they go to use the D word. Diuretic. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big conversation, right? That's what everybody's always talking about, these diuretics and things. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I am not a proponent of heavy diuretic use. I think that the diuretics should be really, really, I mean, again, I don't, I don't even like diuretics, to be honest with you. If you knew how many times. The one time yeah. I tried them for a show, I was the worst I ever looked. Right. Um, water fills muscle. If you dehydrate yourself too much going into a show, you will end up being flat. You will yep. look like crap. It's really hard. And, because and whenever you, you start can't road. survive on stage. You can't flex. You can't pump. You can't. So, yeah. So the, here's the thing. With the diuretics, and, and I'm going to talk from personal experience with all the athletes that I work with. You cannot discriminate between muscle water and sub Q water. The diuretic doesn't say, I'm going to take this diazide or I'm going to take whatever it is that you're going to take. And I'm going to just pull from water under the skin and my glutes and my midsection. It doesn't work that way. Use of diuretics is for people who aren't in shape. That's right. That's right. If you're in shape, there is absolutely zero, zero. I mean, there's, there really is no reason to use diuretics at all. Because you should be in shape six weeks out and eat your way into the show. Plain and simple. There you go. Yep. And so, and if you have to use them, number one, you're either in shape, uh, not in shape and, or number two, you're on so many drugs that you're getting a water retention from all the side effects of the other drugs you're on. So therefore that, that you, that's that. There's so much estrogen that you're so water retained from that. Um, that you haven't mitigated that correctly. Uh, right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, people who are waterlogged per se, right. either did something wrong with their sodium, they did something wrong with the food they were eating, They then then they were doing some kind of drug that made them hold all sorts of water. Like uh, they ended up hypothyroid for whatever reason, or they ended up with, you know, 
any of these things, but then, then you're just fighting the side effects of things again, you know, and, um, and that could be really bad when it comes to dehydrating, getting on stage and, oh man, bad, yeah. bad combo. Yeah. People don't know half the, half the Olympias that, you know, <laughs> that I worked with Phil on, he didn't even use a diuretic. He didn't like at all. I mean, we're talking about nothing. We're talking about Mr. Olympia. I'm not talking about some natural guy at 150 pounds, uh, you know, winning the LA. I'm talking about like literally really a top level guy because he was always in shape. So if you're sure. When I did my pro show at the Pittsburgh show in 2016, I, I was on stage and prejudging. I was sweating. I was dripping on stage a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I was shredded. I was in good shape. I got some great pictures. I can show you. So um, I'm walking off and there's a, a coach from the area who was on the stage there. And he, and he says to me, man, if you were dehydrated enough, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be sweating on stage. <laughs> like, he's like, did you take some diuretics? Why are you, you're, why are you sweating? Why am I sweating? Oh, God. Hot lights, stage. Yeah. Yeah, I was sweating. I had a, I did have a, a, a bad coat of tan. Uh -huh. So um, it was like way too thick. And so just right. any little sweat was dripping. Right. Right. So I'm like, I just, I didn't even say anything. I was just like, I shook my head and went, wow. Oh, man. I mean, this, yeah. how many people is this guy coaching here? Well, and I mean, you got people starting diuretics two weeks out. I mean, I hear horror stories, horror stories. And if you guys, if you take a little too much testosterone, you take a little too much DECA, you take a little too much, whatever, it's not going to turn around and be detrimental to that degree. Here's another thing. You go ahead and dehydrate, taking a diuretic, got all this blood pressure, you got the, the, the polycythemia, yep. and then you go ahead and take ibuprofen got a headache, you feel sick, whatever, you take some ibuprofen, you go into acute renal failure right then and there. There you go. Acute tubular necrosis, we call that. It's well, and, and after, after the shows, I mean, that's the other thing that I've always preached, right? Like also after the shows, you're, let's say you're cutting your water back. You're just, you're cutting your water back. You're drying out for the show, which is natural. I mean, a lot of, you know, you cut your water back. You're not going to drink as much water the last couple of days. You're going to cut, you're going to taper. That's what I, you know, always advocate tapering your water as you're getting your carbohydrates up, you taper your water. But now let's say if you did type diuretics or if you, if, if you're, even if you're tapering water, you now go into a state of just hyper amounts of sodium, right? Because now post work, post show, you want to go nuts. And this is where this is the, where the problems happen. So if you guys listen up, whether you're trainers or whether you're comp competitors, you are going to end up really destroying your body in the long term when you go and have sushi and you go to the all you can eat McDonald's and you go crazy and you put 20 pounds on in, in eight to 10 hours and you're sitting there just hammering your body because your body's going to hypercompensate. Because now you haven't had sodium, you've cut back your sodium, now you're going into 10, 20 grams of sodium, and then you're eating pizza, you're eating sushi, you're eating just grams and grams of sodium from soy sauce, and then you turn around and, and you can't go nuts. And then, then a lot of them are at these clubs at the after party, and then they're drinking alcohol, and then they want to know how they end up in the ER. And so, guys, you... Yeah, I mean, I've experienced that with many, many, many competitors that come in and say, I gained 30 pounds and why are my legs so swollen? And then you look at their labs and they're, they're in a horrible place. Um, their urine is all brown and, you know, they're just bad news bears, man. Um, the, I, I admit, uh, I'll tell you, when I won my pro card in 2010, I went hog wild because it was always the week before Thanksgiving. God darn it. You know? Because you're doing and, the nationals. Yeah, the Nationals. I won Nationals in 2010, and it was like, it was right the week before Thanksgiving. And so right. they still had pumpkin rolls out. Mm -hmm. Yep, I ate three or four of those in a day. Uh, yeah. You're that, that guy. Good. You're that guy. I was how much that weight guy, did you gain? How much, how much weight did you gain? So oh, I lost the battery again. I'm almost there. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I literally, this is a good story. So I was literally so crazy. I had gotten to my third pumpkin roll in the day because I had my staff. Are you there? Yeah. 
Oh, oh sorry, I thought I lost you. You were so still. Yeah. No, I'm right here, brother. <laughs> I was, I, you, like have on the, you have me on the edge of my like, seat. Like, so what did you do? What did Doc do? What did, what did Victor do? So, so this is why I had like my staff got me a pumpkin roll because I love pumpkin. And I'm just like uh-huh. a pumpkin addict, or whatever. So I, I had uh, a pumpkin roll in the office. I think a patient brought me one later in the day. I ate that. And then I had another one and I brought it home and I started eating half of it. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I put it in the garbage, but I literally set it on the top of the garbage in the container. 10 minutes later, I'm, my wife catches me eating it out of the garbage. <laughs> you got to pour some bleach on it. You got to like some of those girls that got to put bleach on top of their food. 30 pounds in five days. Woo. Ooh. Yeah, I went from sure, did you you check know, it or did you weighing in at 165 and I was almost 205 by the end of it. You had some good pumps though. Oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is oh. like I ate boxes of cereal. I okay, guys, pizza. don't this is what not to do. This I'm, is I'm what, not to do. You, what to not to do. <laughs> because I guarantee you his just, blood pressure was through the roof. And that's especially if he would have you know, if you're taking diuretics and then what ends up happening is you're the hyper rebound is what can kill you. Like people don't die from diuretics from taking diuretics. People take, you know, die from diuretics after the diuretic usage. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I take that back. You can take that. Di- you can die from diuretics from taking them with during the dehydration process, but you can also still do it even a day or two later after you stopped because of the rebound. So just, you know, again, competitor that um that we that i sent to the um er at a show and um a recent one and they came back to the hotel and they were like there were so many people there at the er oh wow the the the, the er docs were like what's going just, on what's going on what's going on here today what was happening i'm like was that was that because of the diuretics doc I mean, I think it was that what we're talking about, people either, you know, having arrhythmias, um, getting syncopal, getting, um, you know, uh, electrolyte dysfunctions and palpitations and um, renal failure, whatever. I mean, people having all sorts of problems. Um, But um, yeah, I've been to the ER with a number of people over the years. I was going to say one that uh, you probably knew very well, but um, I can't remember if he's talked about it in public or not. So <laughs> I'm not going to mention that one, but very popular guy. Um, but things like uh, pancreatitis can occur from the toxicity. Um, I think I know who you're talking about. He was a top Olympia guy, right? I think we were both there for that one. Yeah. I, I, spent, six, I, yeah. I spent six hours. Uh, yeah. I think I know who you're talking about. In the ER with that guy. Yeah. And we became good friends. Yeah. Actually. I think, uh, I think it was, uh, during supposed to be during a guest posing, I believe. And, uh, yeah. So I think I know who you're talking about. Um, yeah, not one of my clients. Yeah. <laughs> not, not one of my clients, but it's just, um, so, you know, in, 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 in conclusion here, what do you think it's going to take to, to get these people to get, you know, scare them straight? I mean, I mean, I, we're putting this information out there and I'm not trying to scare them straight. Like this is, these are not, this isn't bullshit. This is real. So what, what do you think is it's going to take to get these people to kind of wise up? I think it's education. It's what we're doing right now. Conversations that continue, Mm -hmm. not just when people are dying, because it will ebb and flow. I'm sure. Um, I think it's education from whether it be on a website, that's very popular, your own websites, whatever. People want to put out some information, get some articles going, get some, get the conversation going about these peptides and the, you know, people like yourself who are well respected by competitors, by people interested in starting competing and things. Um, getting the get, getting the word out that these are the things you've got to that just have to end. And these are the things you got to watch out for if you're going to do this and this. You know, we need more education amongst all the other um, coaches out there or gurus or whatever you want to call them that are prescribing things. That's one of the things I hear a lot. They prescribe me to do this, but they're not a doctor. Yeah. So 
they're recommending that you do something. You better do your research about it. You better learn what it is you're putting in your body. If somebody says, here, take this before you go on stage, you better know what the heck that is. Right. It's your own responsibility to figure out what's happening and get the right information. And that should always involve getting more information, whether it be getting information about what it is or getting information about what's happening in your body. So I do virtual visits. You want to reach out to my sure. office and we set up a visit and say, hey, let's look at what your yeah. let's you get guys to want, labs. I'm going to put a link here. You guys, I want you guys, if you want to do a virtual visit with uh, my good friend, Dr. Victor Prisk, um, you know, he's on Eastern Standard Time. I saw for my staff, I have a nurse practitioner who does a lot of the virtual visits for me. So perfect. I'm in the operating room and she's doing those things. Yeah. Yeah. So go, go ahead and get in more ortho and wellness.com ortho and wellness.com. And i um, be glad to help you out with that. Yeah. No, and I any of your clients, if they want to check, just let, reach out to me. You know, you can text me anytime. I, I know that I've always, you know, you've always been there and uh, normally you're texting me going, Phil looks crazy, bro. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I go back and I look at my text messages. Yeah, I miss and, those uh, days hanging out yeah. with Jay and Phil. That was yep, a good yep. time. We so had some really good times. I'd be in, I'd be coming into Pittsburgh and I'd go to Jim, Jim Mannion's gym and, and then I'd see, you you know, show up and they're like, Hey, doc showed up. So it's always, yeah, a, it's always good, good seeing you. Good pictures with, with Phil doing bicep workouts and this and that. <laughs> Yeah, I think you were there when I think you were there when 2013 when he was in the orange tank top when JM shot us. I think you'd oh, come yeah, by. Yeah, got, I think yeah, you were yeah, there. I've got a lot of pictures yeah. of that one where he's yeah. looking at me like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm like, um, hey, Phil, you want to do some more negatives on that? And he'd be like, bro, look at my yeah. biceps. <laughs> I, just, I mean, there's the stories of I used to make him not train arms literally up until three weeks before the show. And then he would start training arms, but um, we're going to wait to get Phil on here. And so he can talk a little bit about all the great times. Yeah, I was just chatting with him, I think a week ago. So awesome. it's good. Awesome. It's good to catch up. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, again, we'll put all the information down here. Um, guys, again, don't forget, let us know what you think. Go ahead and let us know what you think about the state of bodybuilding. Let us know what you think if you have any questions or if you want to, because um, I'm going to do a follow up at some point. Um, I'm going to. Uh, so if you have questions, additional questions for Dr. Uh, Victor Prisk uh, or myself, you can go ahead and put it in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to go ahead and smash that like button and make sure that you go ahead and share this because it'll show that we are you, you like the content and you want to see more of it. So again, Hani Rambod. Uh, Dr. Victor Prisk, and that's the truth. The truth. <laughs>